why would it be exactly 46 and a half? No matter how you measure it, it's 46 and a half. Close encounters of the second kind are encounters that leave behind some form of physical evidence. Two types are most often reported. First, the bodies of cattle, horses, and occasionally wild animals mutilated by some sort of high-tech equipment. Second, are crop circles, enormous elaborate designs that appear overnight stamped into the fields as if by some heavenly artist. To my amazement, there was a huge circle in an RC rape field up there. I nearly crashed the car because I was so excited. The crop circle phenomenon began in the mid-1970s. English farmers started finding giant circles in their fields, pressed into their crops with the precision of a cookie cutter. Many thought it must all be some kind of hoax, or perhaps funny weather. It was strange, though. There were never any unusual tracks leading out to the circles and no reports of odd weather. Baffled scientists flocked to circle locations, hoping to find a reasonable explanation for the phenomenon. But one by one, theories blaming disease, helicopters, tornadoes, and hoax artists were shot down. I've come across many hoaxes, and you can tell them within two minutes, because the normal circles, the corners, just simply gently move down and the stalks are not broken. Anybody that tries to reproduce a hoax circle by chain, trampling, any way you may think, will damage the structure of the crop involved. What does it all mean? Well, this is one case where your guess is probably as good as any. There are as yet no prevailing theories on how the circles are being formed. Remember, we are stepping into the unknown. Banded together into an organization for scientific examination of the circles, British researchers are baffled at the fact the bent over crops keep growing and show no signs of any physical contact. They say their evidence does indicate the circles are formed in about five to ten seconds and are caused by some tugging force, though the roots are not pulled from the soil. And the circles aren't confined only to Britain. <laughs> Japan is one of the many places crop circles have shown up in the last few years, along with Canada and here in the United States, throughout the Midwest, in towns like Milan, Illinois. I thought to myself, how could anything do that without it didn't come out of the sky and come down here? Now they almost come down and do this because there's no way it could get in here. No alien droppings whatsoever, no. It might be a tornado or some kind of wind, but it's... Why would it be exactly 46 and a half? No matter how you measure it, it's 46 and a half. During the last few years, while the rest of the world got used to the appearance of crop circles, British farmers found their encounters changing. Now, they weren't just circles anymore. The most amazing thing was that in 1990, in May, we started getting these pictograms, which are these dumbbell or barbell-shaped uh, formations with various features coming out of them, features like hands and claws, uh, semicircles on the end, all of these things. We've never seen anything like that before. The British hoaxsters who recently claimed credit for the crop circles could demonstrate only the crudest designs, and the quality and quantity of their handiwork left most experts unconvinced. When you go into the extra pieces that were there, the claw features, key pattern, that sort of thing, we found they were still as precise, and the floor patterns were very, very uh, precise. It is impossible to reproduce an entire structure like that, which is nearly 300 feet in length, without creating an immense amount of damage in its construction. Despite attempts by a wide range of experts, no one has been able to photograph a circle being made. But strange sounds have often been recorded lingering within the circle area, sounds that can best be described as a trilling noise. And researchers do get plenty of reports of strange sightings. We've got Oh, at least, at least 20 or more cases of uh, circles which are formed following the following UFO activity or following globes of light which have descended into the field or lights which have uh, shone beams down into the field. Clearly, they uh, seem to be related to electromagnetism. There's overwhelming evidence of that. But how electromagnetic forces can produce this effect we don't know. What I think is becoming very clear now is that we are forced to conclude that because these patterns are very symmetrical and very beautiful, that they are designs. They are designs and therefore there's a designer. And therefore there's an intelligence of some sort behind the design. 
Um, this is the, f the fifth cattle uh, steer that's been mutilated uh, since uh, mid-spring of this year. North American livestock farmers are also dealing with a strange phenomenon that's been classified as a close encounter of the second kind. Although this one is as repulsive as the crop circles are beautiful. Since the mid-60s, some ranchers in the American and Canadian West have been finding dead animals in their fields. Investigators have dismissed predators as a probable cause because there are rarely any tracks around the body, not even the tracks of the animal itself. The carcasses are usually neatly cut open, organs removed with surgical precision, and as Joel Bradshaw discovered on his ranch in Arkansas, the aftermath is an oddly bloodless scene. The blood had been taken away. There was no blood, nowhere you could take a piece of white piece of cloth and lay again it and you didn't get no blood or nothing. Some have said cult followers are to blame, but medical evidence makes that unlikely. Tissue samples sent to Oregon State University for testing showed that high heat had been used to make the strange rippled incisions, heat like that of a medical laser. So maybe it's the work of high-tech cultists. Well, medical lasers didn't even exist when this phenomenon began, and even today's so-called portable lasers require a generator the size of a large freezer. Many farmers say they don't need medical evidence. They know their fields very well, and animals and humans would leave evidence behind. Human beings will always make mistakes along that line. They'll forget something or drop something, or, but there's no sign you can go off 50 yards around it and never find anything. As with crop circles, UFO sightings often seem to precede the mutilations. There have been possibly 15,000 of these cases uh, in the United States and Canada since the 60s. And, you know, you look at the records, you look at if there's, if there's anybody been prosecuted, has anybody been arrested, and you don't find that. You don't find any prosecutions, you don't find any arrests. In a forensic sense, you use all the information, you look at all of them. And when you get all of that information and you run it through a sieve, you come out that, that there is some other non-human entity doing this. So who or what is plucking animals from their fields, only to return them later, dead and missing some of their organs? Journalist and documentary filmmaker Linda Moulton Howe, who helped bring the mystery to light with her book, An Alien Harvest, has a theory. The mutilations are part of some incredible extraterrestrial genetic research that is linked to the phenomenon of human abductions. What's unknown is, is the genetic experiment to make something from our DNA, the cattle DNA, other animal DNA, and take it away somewhere? Or is it to make something that is going to cohabit with us on this planet? Or some reason that is impossible for us to even imagine? Whether it's animal mutilations or crop circles, both close encounters raise interesting questions about what they mean. Could they be part of some extraordinary plan? One theory suggests that if the pictograms are formed by extraterrestrials, they may be a non-threatening way for preparing the human race for eventual open contact. I think there is a symbolism embodied in the circles which is uh, highly relevant and something which we probably can't all understand at, a, at an intellectual level, but possibly we understand it at a subconscious level. I think there's great significance to this, though. I think um, that the circles will probably change all of this. Coming up, this man claims to have had a close encounter of the third kind, the sighting of an alien being. My Uncle Ted was standing more over here, kind of, leaned over like this and we're talking to this creature. Beyond spacecraft sightings and physical evidence is another category of close encounter, the third kind, interaction with alien beings. The most thoroughly documented incident in UFO history led to an encounter of this kind. It occurred on a desolate stretch of New Mexico desert in 1947. That year, hundreds of UFOs were reported across the West. UFO researchers theorized that perhaps because the army was testing nuclear weapons, aliens were interested in how advanced our technology had become. And on July the 2nd, one of those hundreds of flying objects supposedly crashed, setting the stage for a close encounter of the third kind.
Roswell, New Mexico. It's as quiet and peaceful today as it has been for decades. But on July 8, 1947, that tranquility was shattered by a local newspaper headline. Air Force captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. The story described wreckage of a flying disc found near a place called Corona and was based on a press release written by the public information officer at Roswell Air Base, Lieutenant Walter Hawk. This building here, uh, building number 84, is a building, I believe, that they brought materials from the Corona crash and stored them in here temporarily. The chief intelligence officer at the base, Major Jesse Marcel Sr., was sent out to the ranch to collect the crash debris and transport it to the Army Air Force headquarters for examination. In the meantime, newspapers all over the western United States picked up the story. But before Marcel had landed his plane and strange cargo, the Air Force issued a second bulletin. By the time the B-29 with Jesse Marcel and some of the wreckage got to the headquarters two hours after they left in Fort Worth, Texas, the fix was already in to kill the story. The second press release was far different from the first, saying the wreckage was actually from a weather balloon. Could the Army's top intelligence investigators have committed such a basic blunder, failing to recognize the mundane remains of a weather balloon when they first encountered it? No, says nuclear physicist and part-time UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, who's been investigating the Roswell crash for over a decade. He says that while Marcel was in the air, the Roswell base commander, Brigadier General Roger Rainey, got orders from Washington to cover up the incident. And what he did was arrange for the wreckage of a weather balloon, the radar reflector on a weather balloon. And for a while, the saucer saga was forgotten, and might have remained so if Major Marcel hadn't rekindled the fire in 1980, just before he died. Marcel admitted that the weather balloon story had been fabricated to hide the truth. He told Walter Hutt there really was a saucer crash. He made statements to the effect that it was nothing of this world. It couldn't be bent, torn, cut, uh, pierced, <laughs> burned. Uh, he went through a whole list of them. He said, we just don't have the technology to produce material like I brought in from that ranch. The government steadfastly maintains that there never was a crash near Roswell. But Friedman contends his research shows there was not just one, but two UFO crashes that day, the result of a spectacular mid-air collision. Which brings us to our close encounter of the third kind. Friedman says wreckage of the second craft landed some 200 miles away from the first. And this time, there were survivors. When I first came up to the, the craft, the creatures were laying like this in a line side by side and the live one was was over here Gerald Anderson says he was five years old when he and his family came across the unearthly wreckage and bodies and my dad was kind of oh, right about here and he was sitting like this my uncle Ted was standing more over here kind of leaned over like this and they were talking to this creature Anderson's story matches that of others who were in the area at the time. With the help of hypnotherapy, he's been able to remember the encounter with startling detail. His description matches those from people who claim to have seen aliens. Four feet tall, grayish skin, large eyes, long skinny arms and fingers. Anderson recalls two aliens were dead, a third dying, and a fourth alien survivor seemed to be trying to communicate. Then just suddenly he turned and he looked at me. And when that happened, all kinds of things just started happening inside my head. I, I, I started getting sensations of tumbling and falling and an awful loneliness, like there was no way he could possibly get back to where he came from. Anderson says that within a matter of minutes, the military arrived, sealing off the area. The civilians at the site were threatened with bodily harm if they talked. Nevertheless, in the past 20 years, hundreds of witnesses have come forward, some daring to speak, only on their deathbeds. Out in the New Mexico desert, there's no longer any trace of alien craft. Stanton Friedman says the story can't be covered up forever. There were simply too many witnesses. We have testimony from over 200 people concerned with these events, people who handled the wreckage, people who described the bodies. 
people who were had direct orders military orders to do this that or the other thing we have consistent testimony that in a court of law would convict anybody of a crime even with the overwhelming amount of testimony the government has refused to acknowledge that either crash ever happened none of the debris has surfaced neither have any official documents and most of the first-hand witnesses have died as for the captured alien the most often told story suggests that he lived for a few years at a military installation and then died of an unexplained illness in the early 50s.